Have you ever wanted to open up your own exclusive clothing boutique store, but you just don't know where to start? Well, today we're talking to Lee Smith, the founder of Urbanity, who started this beautiful store six months out of college. In this episode, we're talking to Lee about how he started this boutique clothing store and the business now generates more than $100,000 a month. We will give you guys an inside look into the clothing industry, the boutique side of things, and what it takes exactly to run a successful clothing store. Lee, let's talk about the cost it takes to run a boutique store. What are the advantages of having a brick and mortar store, you know, uh, versus e-commerce? That's always been it from day one. Get the most exclusive brands, the hardest to get brands, the top tier brands. I know trends that are happening way before they hit. That's a big tip for you guys. Urbanity has also been featured in GQ when the rapper Jay-Z wore one of Lee's t-shirts courtside at the Nets game. Is this boutique business seasonal? What does that translate to dollars? It's important, like that's your first step into the showing people who right. you are. My phone hasn't rang like that ever in my life, and it can run us, you know, between 50, 70,000 a month. 50% is standard in retail. Wow. Okay. It's called keystoning. We'll talk more about what it really takes to run a successful clothing boutique store in terms of locating the brands that you want to carry, how to make those decisions uh, when you're first starting out, how to properly allocate your budget, where to spend money, and so much more. So you guys, without further ado, let's go talk to Lee. Before we do that, we would appreciate if you hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell so that you don't miss any of our videos. Guys, we have an incredible offer from our sponsor, Shopify. Anybody selling products online has to jump on this opportunity, so stay tuned for that. All right, you guys, we're here with Lee Smith, the founder and CEO of Urbanity, the clothing boutique store here in Bellevue. Lee, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Uh, let's start with your story. When and why you opened Urbanity, and did you have prior experience in the clothing industry? Yeah, so in, man, probably 2007, um, I, my sister was living in New York, and I went to New York, and I saw all these clothing boutiques and all these one-stop shops that you could get a pair of shoes, a pair of pants, a shirt, and a hat in one location. And ever since I took that trip, it just sparked this idea like Seattle doesn't have this true one-stop shop. Because at the time, you'd have to go to Nike Town to get shoes, Nordstrom's to get jeans, Zoomies to get a t-shirt, and Lids to get a hat. And I was like, this is kind of ridiculous. Like, clearly this concept works in other places. Like, let's bring it here. Where did the word urbanity come from? What's the inspiration there? Yeah, so I sat down for two months and put together a 75-page business plan. Wow. Like, as detailed as possible. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, but <laughs> I knew that this was an important part, right? And I had put urbanity on the title page. I saw the name somewhere, um, and I looked it up, and it said, an urban state of being. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And I just put it there just kind of as a placekeeper, and I started to kind of show my family and friends the business plan. And everyone's like, that name, like, they, it just stuck with them, just you know? Of. Yeah, like, and it actually had meaning behind it. You know, people definitely remember it. I mean, they don't know how to pronounce it, but once they do, they remember it, you know? <laughs> Curious to know what the investment looked like for you when you first got started 11 years ago. How much did you need? And how was that broken down? Break it down, was it 10 grand? What, how was it spent to get going? Yeah, so I went and got a loan at 23 for a quarter million dollars. Well, yeah. what kind of loan was it? It was um, just from, I went to a local bank with that 75 page business plan. They called me back, said it was one of the best they've ever seen. Nice. Asked me if I had professional help. That was the initial loan we got and we put a large amount of it, way too much towards the build out because I wanted the store to have a very specific look. The rest of it basically went to inventory um, because I was the only employee there for the first seven months, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it just went to, you know, having the cash flow to run the business monthly. But man, talk about a great payoff on a business plan that you had no idea what you're doing. I had no idea what I was doing, Dude, but I knew awesome. it was detailed and I knew I did a really good job because one thing I can do is I can write. Okay. 
Writing is an important skill. Writing is a very uh, important skill. Yeah. So what were you all in then? Did you get a 250 loan plus you ended up going over that number? So for, that was the original location. Okay. And then we got a new one, another 250 for this location. Gotcha. So yeah. you have two total? Yeah. Nice, okay. Yeah. The first year in business, mm -hmm. what was your revenue and how long did it take you to break even? I would say first year, ugh, probably like 150,000. Um, for the year? Yeah. Wow, yeah. okay. So a little bit of difference from now. Shell change um, compared to now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, and to break even, honestly, took a while, man. I mean, with loan payments and everything, we probably actually were profitable after a couple of years, but. Wow, um, okay. No, yeah. it's good to know. Yeah, but I mean, obviously those payments go down and then, you know, you get to a point where you pay them off and, you know, things become a lot more profitable. So. This business is different. We interviewed some businesses where their break even point was like after the first gig. <laughs> so yeah, this is completely this is different. different. You got to, it takes a lot of money to get it going, mm -hmm. you know, and to make it because your brand's the most important part. So the build out and the inventory, it's important. Like that's your first step into the showing people who right. you are, you know? So I think it's worth it to spend the money, but just spend it smartly. You're creating an experience. Right, exactly. And that's how I feel here. Okay. Yeah. Any tips, advice to our viewers in terms of getting the financing, securing the financing uh, on that note? Yeah. So. I mean, really, like I said, with the business plan, that was really important, like detailed business plan, monthly costs, what you expect revenue wise. Obviously, we know it's going to be some of what we guess, but they just want to see that to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and I think going in there confident. I mean, this was a pretty new concept when I brought it to them, but I think it um, it was interesting and they believed in me and that's what they told me so i obviously did something you know and i think it was just being confident because i knew it was going to work that's i never awesome. doubted it man that's pretty cool uh you shared something with me off camera that we or lee will share with you guys later in the video it's an incredible hack that'll help you in this particular business so keep watching Let's talk about monthly revenue. Where are you at today? Um, is this boutique business seasonal? Do you have high months, low months? What time that is? And what does that translate to dollars? Yeah, so it's definitely seasonal. I would say at times, right? Because you know, let's say right now we're in October. Okay. You just had back to school. Then you have holiday coming up. So you know October is gonna be a little bit slower after holiday, January and February. Like Right, okay. pretty slow, but then it'll kick back up in spring and into summer. So it's, you kind of have to, you definitely need to plan for those months, mm -hmm. right? Plan your inventory, know how much you've made the previous year, kind of year over year, know where you're going um, and buy your inventory according to that. Where's your revenue today on a monthly basis? So it can go monthly. anywhere between from 125 to let's say like a slow month could be 80 or 90. Okay. Yeah. Averages out to somewhere in the hundreds. Yeah. That's a pretty, pretty good numbers. For those watching and want to get into this industry, what would your advice be in terms of when they should get in? Like, should they time it or it doesn't matter? Just start it, start it during the slowest season in October, for example. It depends. What's your advice? If they're just starting, do not open in December. November and December are always going to be your craziest. So you need to get a couple months under your belt, field things out, say, okay, I kind of know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Let's ramp this up because otherwise you're just going to be swimming, man. It's going to be like thrown yeah. into the fire. Give us one piece of advice for someone just starting in the boutique store on how to find brands. Okay, so what I did before I even had the store officially was I went to a trade show with about 200 business cards and just walked up to whatever brands I liked or knew, introduced myself, said what I was trying to do and got their contact. The big thing is get these brands contact information whether it's sold through an agency or wherever it's being sold by, um, 
go and introduce yourself, let them know what you're doing and that you're interested in their brand and just start that communication. You know, even if you get mm -hmm. rejected, at least they know who you are. The next trade show, you go and see them again and eventually you build up that rapport and that relationship. That's awesome. That's really good advice. Yeah. Quick note for you guys, you can find more incredible advice on the podcast that we just launched, upflip.com forward slash podcast. We interview incredible people such as Lee to give you guys all the insights on how to be successful in the business and everything else you need to know. What's the typical profit margin that I guess in general average you want to operate under? And then second question is different inventory. What's got the highest profit margins? What's got the lowest? How do you operate through that? Yeah, so it's more so um, brands that change because certain brands may have less or more, but 50% uh, is standard in retail. Wow. Okay. It's called keystoning. Um, and then you'll get some brands that maybe a bigger brand might be a little bit below that, like 47%, but then a smaller brand will be at 60%. I mean, we have brands that are at 70%. So it really just depends on the brand specifically, but you usually don't want to go below 50% unless you're working with a huge brand, you know? And, and you're saying that's called keystoning? Correct, yeah. Interesting, yep. the 50%. Yep. Um, do you mind sharing which uh, your products here uh, are the high profit margin products? Maybe which As the, brand or? Yeah, independent labels. Okay. So ones that basically are small and they'll give you more because they want to be in your store. Whereas mm -hmm. a big brand doesn't, you know, they're like, we're the man, you yeah. know, we're, this is our profit margin. This, but. And that's another thing is, you know, smaller brands need the revenue, so they're gonna give you a better profit margin. Gotcha, is there one that you focus on more particularly than the other, or you try to have a balanced things of inventory-wise? Balance for sure, yeah. Okay. You gotta have a little bit of everything, you know? You want some low price, you want high, I try to give price points for every product for every customer. I think that's really important. That's smart. How much of your revenue comes from an e-commerce site, uh, let's start there. So we can't sell a lot of our products online, our main brands, mm -hmm. um, pretty much 90% of it because it's so exclusive. I see. They don't allow us to sell online, yeah. So, but you do have a website. Talk to us about that a little bit, how it's built and how you're using it. Yeah, so we have a website um, that directs to our uh, Instagram which is where we sell most of our products. We just, because we can post everything on there and people can message us mm -hmm. and it's built on Shopify. Okay. Would you recommend to someone who has a store with products that they're selling to use Shopify or what platform, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, Shopify has been great for us. It's very easy to use, pretty self-explanatory and has always been solid. Okay. So you're taking traffic from your website and driving it to Instagram. Correct, yep. So they can, they see all the images and we post everything we get on Instagram. So mm -hmm. we actually, social media is free, you know, use it. Take advantage Take of it. Take advantage of it and just engage and post all your new products on there. And you'll see if you do it consistently that your customers will all follow. Um, and right as you post, if they want it, I'll send you a message and boom. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wanted to mention you guys, since we mentioned Shopify, Shopify is actually the sponsor for today's video. They are the number one trusted e-commerce platform for businesses, trusted by more than 1.7 million people around the globe. If you have a business where you sell products, give Shopify a try. The link is in the description below. Try them for free for 14 days and see how it goes. Let's talk about inventory that doesn't sell, mm -hmm. right? What do you do with it? We luckily don't have a lot, nice. um, barely good. at all. But what we'll do is, you know, I wouldn't give a specific um, timeline on it, but okay. when I feel something's gotten like, it's not moving, we can move it, we'll move it to half off. Okay. Um, and that usually gets it going pretty quick. So you just um, slash the price? Yeah, just slash the price after like, you know, X amount of time that you, you kind of feel mm -hmm. um, that it's getting a little stale. So that's it. Nothing to it. Like no special advertising, marketing on social media, just for the stuff that needs to move. Not really, because okay. um, luckily, like I said, uh, we're a very exclusive boutique. So mm -hmm. all the clothes we get 
are usually in and out really quick. That's why we turn over inventory so quickly because um, we always want new stuff. We don't do deep size runs. We want it in and out, and that's what our customers want as well. So okay. we don't get with, left over with too much stuff. What's a deep size run? You mentioned that. I'm not familiar with that term. Yeah, so like um, a small through double X, right, is mm -hmm. the size run. And okay. then, I mean, if you're Nordstrom's, you'll do a thousand of each, you know. Oh, if you're okay. us, we only want to do one or two of each because oh, we wow. want it to keep it exclusive, get it, get it out. And that's what our customers appreciate as well. Let's talk about social media. You mentioned Instagram. What else are you using and what are you doing there specifically, technically, to just continue to promote your brand and, and build your customer base and revenue? Yeah, our Instagram is our main, um, just because pictures, right? Pictures, people want to see the product. I think taking good pictures of the product is important. Lighting's important, but also a lot of brands don't ever answer questions or kind of standoffish, mm -hmm. but we're very attentive to our customers um, and we'll show them more pictures. We'll help them, you know, put, the, I get messages all the time. Hey, I have $300. Can you pick me out an outfit? Nice. Okay, cool. You know, so um, yeah, social media wise, I mean, it naturally goes on Facebook from Instagram, but we mm -hmm. don't get any yeah, engagement from Facebook. Do you really. spend money on Instagram or Facebook? Or we just... have, if we, need to promote something specifically, but we get so much engagement on our posts anyways, it's, we don't really need to. Since our stuff sells so quickly, it's, you know, I don't feel a need to spend some money just to push something that's gonna sell out anyways. Who takes the time to respond? Because I, I don't have any social media, but I remember mm -hmm. days when, man, just people constantly writing, and do you have a designated person for that? How does that work? Yeah, so honestly, it's me or any of the employees at any given, like whoever sees it will mm -hmm. respond, but okay. I'm a very like, kind of OCD with my messages and my email. So I don't like anything outstanding. Like I like to take care of everything clean, respond to everyone. Like I'm pretty on top of it. I know yeah. what that's like, okay. Yeah. So Lee, you're pretty exclusive small boutique store. You, you mentioned that a couple times. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, how that evolved. Did you know from the inception that you want to be exclusive and this is the target audience? Or did that evolve over time? Like, can you sh elaborate on that process and how you came to this point? Yeah, so we always wanted to be exclusive because that's what makes us different from the big block stores, right? If you can go into a big block and get something that a thousand other people are gonna buy, mm -hmm. it's not exclusive. Our customers want something that one or two other people may have, nice. you know, and that's what really drives our business is a fashionable customer that wants things that not everyone has access to. Nice. So that was part of your original business plan, right? Yeah, that's always been it from day one. Get the most exclusive brands, the hardest to get brands, the top tier brands that only want to be in one store in this area and we're the only place that can get them. For people watching you right now who have a passion for the clothing industry, they want to get into the boutique mm -hmm. side of things, what can you tell them in terms of how to determine the customer, right? You've got the skateboarders, you've got the snowboarders, you've got all kinds of industries that you could be exclusive to. Right. How do you make that decision? How would you do that? Well, it has to be an offset of you. Mm. You know what I mean? I, like I said, I've been collecting shoes since I was 13, waiting in line. Like, this is what I always loved. I always loved the streetwear, the sneakers. So whatever clientele you want to go after, you have to be that clientele yourself. How did you choose your first location, Lee? And why did you have to move after the first four years? Yeah, so my first location was obviously, I was six months out of college. I just wanted a brick and mortar retail store. And I, uh, I lived right around that area. It was right by uh, University of Washington, lots of college kids, and it was a brand new development. Um, so it was a great place to just get started and get my feet wet. And then after four years, we moved over here, mm -hmm. which was a huge jump. You know, one of the top malls in the country and the rent price, you know, went up tenfold. Um, but I had to do that first store first. Because mm -hmm. if I would have tried to open this first, there's no way. You it would have been flunked. way too much. I couldn't have handled it. So crawl before you walk, you know? Gotcha. Inventory management. Mm -hmm. What software are you using? What tools are you using to help you manage all that? Yeah, so we use um, Lightspeed which we do all of our inventory and sales through. 
it's really complicated. They just switched over and took away all their old servers. So all of our old sales were gone. No way. Yeah, so I don't, uh, it's not my favorite. Um, and it's, you know, roughly, I think 150 bucks a month or so. Okay. Um, but I think there's better options out there for sure. Um, Have you looked into some of the options personally yeah, for you? Yeah, it's just, we just made the switch. They just made us switch over and we already had all of our inventory in there. So we kind of had no choice. Um, but I definitely a big thing is um, credit card processing. I think a mm -hmm. lot of people get screwed on credit card processing because they'll just use it st straight from their square, um, which the fees are crazy. So my, I highly suggest going and finding a local company. Uh, we use Gravity Payments that will give you the best rates possible. And, they, and you can show them all the rates and make them give you the best one because they'll guarantee that they will. Okay, so again, focus on something local first. Yeah. If you could find someone. Definitely, definitely. Because the bigger companies, they don't care. How do you stay ahead of the trends? How do you stay ahead of your competitors, per se? Right. right. Let's, let's talk about that aspect of this business. I mean, you just always have to have your ear to the street, right? People always ask me, why, why do you still work at the shop? Like, you don't need to. And I'm like, because I hear everything. Mm -hmm. I hear what the customers are coming in and asking for. I do the buying, so I want to know what they're feeling and what they're not feeling. And those kids and those people, those trendsetters will tell you what's, what they want, right? And then you buy off of what they're talking about. I mean, obviously, social media, things like that. Okay. But it's really your customer, you listen to your customer, be in your store, work on the floor, listen, you know? So they're the biggest input for you in By terms far. of the fashion. Yeah, I mean, I, could, I know trends that are happening way before they hit any news article or social media because I'm here, I'm living like in it, you right. know what I mean? Lee, let's talk about the cost it takes to run a boutique store and just roughly where would rents be for this space here in Bellevue? Yeah, so it totally depends on the mall and like what city you're in. Um, but roughly, if you're in a, you know, really good mall, between, you know, 15, 20,000 a month. Okay. And then what does it cost for you monthly to run the store? Um, you know, what's the around, biggest expense? Biggest expense is getting the inventory after rent. Okay. Rent is by far the biggest, biggest expense, but yeah, inventory, and it can run us, you know, between 50, 70,000 a month. Wow, okay. So this store particularly today is averaging right. somewhere right. between the 50, 70. Mm -hmm. When you first opened up, what did you do to get customers to walk through the door. What strategies did you implement? Uh, let's talk about that. So this was back in the day. I literally did flyers. I hired someone to go and put flyers on every single person's car in the neighborhood. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> this was like super street tactic. Um, but no, I did a lot of actually like community events. Mm -hmm. So I did like, had like rappers come, had producers come, did like beat battles and like cool wow. stuff like that. And then uh, worked with a lot of local brands too to kind of just spread the word and let them know we are there. And did you just a matter of reaching out and saying, would you guys come in and do this with me and collaborate and that's it? Yeah, it was, I mean, since it was, you know, like one of the first urban stores, it kind of brought like a lot of the artists in there and hmm. a lot of athletes in there. So we did a ton of stuff with athletes because they just would hear about and come in and then we'd talk and figure out some cool marketing stuff to do with them. What else contributed to you strengthening and building that reputation from day one? Um, well, I actually designed a UW t-shirt for the college. Hmm. Um, that was actually Nordstrom's number one T ever at that time. And so that like blew it up. Um, so you made a T that ended up being selling Yeah, Nordstrom? so the brand we did it with was big in Nordstrom's. Gotcha. And so they took that design, went in there, and it had our tag on the back of it. So, I mean, this was like huge, um, big, big t-shirt, and that really helped out. You go look for the biggest guys in that industry local-wise, right? Mm -hmm. Go to them, come up with your own idea of what you think would be cool, and if they're feeling it, they're gonna, you know, want to support, and it's kind of a win-win, you know? You design right. a cool t-shirt, with a great brand, you get exposure. It works out really well for both of us. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You guys, I want to ask you to comment below and tell us and Lee what 
you're doing, what kind of strategies you're taking to get customers to the door and build your reputation, especially if you're just starting out. We'd love to see your comments. What are the advantages of having a brick and mortar store, you know, uh, versus e-commerce? And what do you get that you wouldn't get in the e-commerce world if right. you went that route? So it's, to me, it's experience, right? You want to go in. I mean, most people don't know how clothes are going to fit on them. If you're shopping online, you have to know exactly what you're buying right. or else then it sits in the back of your car for a month before you finally remember to return it. But mainly just people coming in, needing help picking out outfits. People enjoy talking to people for the most part. They enjoy buying cool stuff and you know having an actual experience versus sitting on a computer and just clicking and hoping something that will, will fit them, you know? I just want to follow up on the 250 that you got. Mm -hmm. You said you spent a little too much on a build out and right. then the rest was inventory. Can you give us more specifics on where the numbers were and then if you do anything different, if you could go back? Yeah, so I definitely spent way too much. I think the build out section was about 150. Um, they reimbursed us for half of that. So let's say I was out about 75, 100K. Mm -hmm. um, that you mean the landlord? Yeah, the okay. landlord for TIs and then I would say roughly about forty to fifty thousand went to inventory immediately. So, you know, that didn't leave me a ton of working capital that I should have kept. The build out was just I just wanted to go all out because mm -hmm. I didn't understand. I was twenty three years old. I just wanted everything to look amazing. Right. The bathroom had tile all <laughs> over it. I mean it was ridiculous. It was stupid, but you know, that's how I learned. That's why this one was way different. That's why the next one will be way different. You know, there's ways to save money and cut costs on your build out to make things look nice, mm -hmm. but not pay for the crazy expensive stuff. Like just be smart about it and look for other options. So three things that you would do differently. Go to Ikea, <laughs> find <laughs> stuff, right. seriously, find stuff that looks nice. People don't know the difference between a custom made table and an Ikea table, like little things sure. like that. Like there's so many little things. I mean, we have stuff mixed and matched that cost a ton of money and that didn't, and no one's ever been able to tell the difference. Second thing is don't waste money in places people aren't gonna see, you know? Uh -huh. like don't a like a bathroom, you <laughs> okay. know, it was ridiculous. No. Um, that was a big one. I still, still piss me off to this day. <laughs> That's um, funny. And then I would say the third thing is if you're working with a contractor and they're subbing people, you know, like really understand where the money's going mm -hmm. because you'll give a contractor a budget, but he's not necessarily breaking it down. Like really pay attention to where this is all going that it makes sense. Okay. Lee, tell us about the biggest challenges that you're faced with today as a business owner. Currently, it's for sure supply chain, mm -hmm. getting inventory. It's been, we've been super busy and it's tough. You know, if the biggest, you know, suppliers that you deal with can't provide product, then you have to go looking for any brand basically that fits the store that can ship you. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly looking for new brands just to fill our shop up. Um, and it's tough because it needs to fit our aesthetic as well. Gotcha. So I was going to ask, how are you shifting or how are you, you know, overcoming that challenge? Yeah, it's basically finding brands that fit the store that can ship immediately. Mm -hmm. And so we've been constant. I've just been constantly looking, you know, and trying to find brands that we can bring in to fill the voids um, and just to have enough product to meet the customer demands. So in terms of that collaboration with the local brand Nordstrom, mm -hmm. did you set up a contract? Was it just a conversation, handshake? And what would you do different? Yeah, it was just a you know, this was my, I was brand new to the scene, eager, didn't know anything about contracts. Um, I didn't sign anything, didn't end that well for me. So I definitely now, knowing what I know, would have signed a contract first and foremost um, with a guarantee on how we're gonna, you know, split the profits. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess it's a red flag if you're trying to collaborate with somebody and they're not willing to sign something that's yeah, it was Black more so I didn't even ask because I didn't even know. Right. You know. I was just excited to work with that brand. I didn't think it would go the way, you know, and get as big as it did. How so. am I, did you leave a lot on the table because of that mistake? I was told I left a lot on the table. And that's when I heard the number, I was, <laughs> ouch. You know. Okay. That's a big tip for you guys. When you collaborate, make sure you got that on, in documents. 
I wanted to ask you one thing you told me off camera, and that's a shirt that you designed, mm -hmm. and it was worn by somebody. Mm -hmm. Can you just share that story real quick? I thought, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, so I had a brand um, a couple years ago, and we had literally every celebrity, you name it, uh, Lil Wayne, Meek Mill, Ludic Ludacris, everyone, but the nice. cool, uh, I did a one-off sweatshirt for Jay-Z, and he wore it twice court side at the Nets game. That's um, pretty cool. So there's that painting of it up the, on the wall. Right there. Yeah, which That's is- the actual picture. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> and GQ featured it. It was on every blog, ESPN, you name it. So that was definitely, my phone hasn't rang like that ever in my life and probably never Dang. will once they showed that on ESPN. But yeah, it was So it was definitely cool. a booster for the business. Oh yeah, Just it was- Just that type of branding. It was surreal and, too, because that's wow. like, for me, that's kind of who you know, I look up to as a businessman mm -hmm. um, to have him actually wearing like my own that I made specifically for him. That's and it was cool. like a year after we gave it to him. So it just popped up out of nowhere. <laughs> and we're like, what, what's going on? So yeah, nice. that, was, that was cool, man. Thanks, Jay-Z. We appreciate it. How many employees do you currently have? And then what key traits do you look for when hiring for this industry? Okay, so we have five, well, six including myself, and the main thing is really, I don't care about your resume. I don't really care about anything. It's just, I can tell if it's gonna be the right fit when I sit down and talk to you. Mm -hmm. For a small business owner, trust is always the main thing, right? The number one, and then it goes to, do they fit the vibe of whatever your business is? Are they knowledgeable about that? And then it's how do they treat and interact with customers. That's it. Yeah, so those are really my main things. Um, but you, the trust one's important for sure. What's one thing in, as a business owner that you just hate a lot and you wish you wouldn't have to do? I'm sure that's real for all of us. Yeah, I hate accounting <laughs> more than anything. You're not a numbers um, guy. I like to look at the numbers, but I don't like to figure out you know, all the in-between. Luckily, we have someone that is amazing at that and very uh, detail-oriented. Um, but I like to look at the bigger picture, see the bigger things, not be in the weeds on Excel and, you know, figuring that out. So, so you solved that problem by I doing what? Hiring? By, yeah, hiring someone who daily costs down to the cent. I can open it up anytime, any day. It's updated every day so I know exactly where we are. I know exactly how much money is coming in, how much is going out. It's to a T and it's like I said, I like to look at it. I don't like to be the one inputting it. How are you finding brands, clothing to get into your store? What tools are you using? Well, I use, I mean, a lot of social media, um, but I also have young employees Mm -hmm. that are really into this. Obviously they work here, they're really into this stuff. So they're, you know, young and know all the new and upcoming brands. So they will say, hey Lee, look at this. We like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So I trust them. I know they know what's going on. I know, you know, they're good employees. So they help me a lot to bring in different stuff and unique stuff that I wouldn't even have seen. Okay, so besides social media, it's really again, the people, the employees, the, people. the customers. Yep, definitely people that employees that you trust their opinions and you know that they want what's best for the shop. In terms of being an owner of a boutique store, what skills do you think would really contribute to your success? I mean, do you have to be fashionable to do well in this industry? Or what does it come down to? I think fashionable uh, definitely is a must, okay. um, you know, because you can't be selling clothes looking like you don't know how to dress. Um, <laughs> that's a good start. That's a very important one, but you have to be ready to go with the flow. Like you need to, you know, when something else pops up, be ready. When a new mm -hmm. brand pops up, be ready. Um, so it's constantly changing and moving and you just have to be ready for that. And also you have to be able to deal with the rough months. Because retail is different every single day. Mm -hmm. You could have a terrible day and a great day, a terrible day. But don't pay attention to that. Like you have to know the end month goal, where you want to be, and if you go day by day, it's like it'll drive you nuts. Right. Like it's just too much, you know? So you have to just have faith and know what the number is that you want to hit at the end of the month. Look at it a little long term. Right. Yep, okay. definitely. 
Now we talked about a hack earlier in the video. Lee, this is your opportunity to share that hack with our audience and uh, we appreciate that. Yeah, so a hack for sure would be when you're starting out, find local brands, smaller independent brands that you guys can both promote each other because they're mm -hmm. gonna have a following, you're trying to gain a following, hype them up, they will hype you up, kind of find a community and that naturally leads you to other brands in that community because they all know each other. And then locally, that's what makes you bubble. As opposed to? As opposed to just opening a store. And like you going know, after just, the big brands that are not even. Yeah, I mean, you're not gonna open and get some crazy account. Like it doesn't work like that. Okay. Like all these brands that you want that are the highest of the high, you have to have a serious track record to mm. be there, even location wise. Like to get where we are now, there's no way I could have done it from the beginning. Like I see. you have to have your reputation. So use what's around you. That's not gonna cost you a ton of money, but will make you bubble up locally. And then once you're established, you can start reaching out to the big dogs and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. This is what we got going on. And then you can kind of get in the door that way. Well, this has been incredible. Uh, I wanna wrap this up with maybe if you have two, three, four pieces of advice in general to all the entrepreneurs looking at this video. I would say, you know, know yourself, like get to know how you react in adverse situations. When your back's against the wall, how, like, how do you react? Mm -hmm. and, and it's okay if, you know, you're not, if you crumble, if you can't handle the pressure, like, but you need to know that about yourself before you get in that situation. You need to know how you're gonna react to it um, because in business, that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna be at, you know, looking at your bank account at midnight with tears in your eyes and saying, how am I gonna pay? Like, I've been there. Like, that's Speaking going experience. to happen, right? Yeah. So you just really need to know how you're gonna react um, if you're a problem solver and, <clears throat> If you, you have to be whatever industry, you can't go into whatever you're doing, just like, hey, I'm gonna make a bunch of money. Like, it's all about the money. Like, mm -hmm. you don't wanna spend your whole life doing something that you hate just because you're making some money. Like, it's terrible, right? Yeah. Like, I could do this for so many years with barely making anything because I enjoy doing it. So I think, you know, as cliche and corny as it is, like, you have to be passionate about what you're doing. And if you put in the right work and the long work, in the end, when you're successful, it's super sweet and worth it, you know? That's awesome. Lee, this has been good. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Likewise. Well, that's a wrap with Lee Smith, the founder of Urbanity. What an incredible story. 11 years in the business. I hope that the questions we asked and the answers you guys heard will greatly benefit you in your business. Comment below. We read all of them. We want to respond. We do this for you guys. So please take a second, like this video if you haven't already. Hit that bell button so that you don't miss anything and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much.